Welcome, my name is David Madoff and we are videotaping a version of a talk that I did earlier in March of 2023. This talk is entitled, Music is Nourishment for the Soul. I chose this topic, it's a, it's a riff on, um, on a saying by Mark Twain, uh, music is the salve for the soul of man. And I truly believe, my thesis here is that music is so critical to our lives as people, as human beings, and our evolution as human beings, but also as Jews. And this is part of a larger program that we put together at Beth Israel entitled Sacred Sounds in Our Lives. I did it in conjunction with our cantor, Dr. Uh, cantor Benjamin Matus. And this is what we covered, Music is the Nourishment of the Soul. This talk, in addition to Sounds of the Holy, and the talk about Nusach, and the last talk on the power of congregational singing. The objectives for today's talk are to explore the differences and similarities between secular and sacred music, then to discuss the role of music in human evolution, and I think it actually was critical in human evolution, and to study the effects on brain activity. And what we'll show you is that listening to music, and especially playing music yourself, lights up the brain and, and activates the brain in many different areas. So first, I'd like to define what sacred music is. So the, the easiest definition is music for religious use is sacred music. But there are other uh, definitions around as well. And the one that I like best as an as a, um, instrumentalist is music performed or composed through divine inspiration. Now I think a lot of the music we hear, even pop, some popular music, is performed or composed through divine inspiration. And I'll show you some examples. And last is, is an interesting definition, music that is special or set apart and not for common use. So with those definitions of music, sacred music in mind, then let's go on to, uh, to discuss the rest of the talk. So this is a wonderful, a wonderful um, uh, saying, a wonderful quote from Ian Cross in his article, Music and Cognitive Evolution. And it states that, quote, music is a central aspect of human experience. That's my thesis, so that's why we're talking about it. It's a reliable source of achievement, meaning, and social connection, and has even been implicated as a causal uh, factor for human cognitive evolution. So we're going to talk about that as well. So what the first part of the talk will entail is I will play a musical piece that you may or may never have heard. Probably you've never heard these. Then I will d discuss these questions. Is this a sacred, is this a sacred or secular piece? And I explain why. Is, uh, what's the ethnic origin of the music, if we can determine that? And what words or emotions does this music invoke? Okay, so here's the first piece.
So, the first question is, is that sacred or secular music? And many of the people at the talk that I did live thought it was a sacred piece. And I truly believe that's a, a sacred piece. And um, it, it's, it's different, it's nothing that you hear regularly, and to me it seems divinely inspired. And you'll see in a second there's actually other evidence why it might have been in, uh, divinely inspired. So what's the ethnic, ethnic origin of the music? And it clearly sounds Jewish. And then it sounds Jewish because of the mode or the scale that they use called the Fregish scale. And that's what this is. And what words or emotions does this music invoke? And to me, it's very sacred, um, it's very meditative, contemplative, peaceful, but also has a sense of joy to it as well. So here's the answer. This is a tune from Ernest Bloch, and he was born in 1880 in Switzerland. He moved to the United States in uh, the early 1920s. He became the head of the uh, Cleveland Conservatory of Music. He wrote many, many pieces for, uh, for Jewish uh, life, and this is called Prayer from Jewish Life, so it's clearly divinely inspired, it's a, it's a sacred piece. It was originally uh, performed and written for cello and piano, and this is an adaptation for the flute. It's very slow and meditative, as we said, and there's some joyful parts to it, and it uses that Fragish scale that I demonstrated previously. Now this is a scale that we think is a Jewish scale, but it's actually uh, a scale that was used by klezmer artists, and here's a tune that, uh, that's a klezmer tune. Tanz, 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 that's a klezmer tune, also Hava Nagila. But it was also, jazz players use it all the time, this is part of the alt or altered scale. It's also from Eastern Europe. Gypsies took it on and the gypsies took it from place to place as they migrated. So it's Persian, it's Persian music has it, Arabic, Egyptian, Indian ragas have it, which I didn't know. Uh, Spanish flamenco dance, as flamenco music has it as well. So that's one example of what I think is a sacred piece. So here's the next example. And I'll play this piece and then we can talk, I'll talk about it. secular or is this sacred music? And many, most everybody here who was here at the time of the talk said that it is secular music. But I would contend that this is sacred music. And, um, and it's reminiscent of the black church. It's, it's, um, it's, it's uh, call and, and response type of thing. Da 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 That's the call. The response is da 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 and it goes on like that, and it goes on like that, it has that high note, that's an exclamation mark. And um, the other question is, uh, is it, what's the ethnic origin? I think it's a, a, a African American piece, and this is an ecstatic piece to me. It's just total joy. 
It turns out that <laughs> this piece was written by Charlie Mingus, one of jazz's uh, best bass players, a prominent composer, and it's called Better Get Hit In Your Soul. Now Mingus was a superb, very highly irascible, a little crazy bassist, and he was a composer in the 50s and the, through the 70s. He, um, he played with Duke Ellington for all of two weeks, so you see why I'm saying irascible. At the end of the two weeks, he ended up chasing Juan Tizal, the, the trombone player, around the stage with a butcher's knife, so Duke had to, had to fire him at that time, unfortunately. He's highly influenced by his up, upbringing in Watts, Los Angeles, his church experience, and this is a church piece, basically. He, read, he wrote a bunch of these, like this. This tune's in a major mode, where the, the last tune was in the fragish mode, which is, uh, which is a combined mode. It's not minor or major, it has com uh, combinations of both. So this is a different type of tune, which I would, I would submit is also a sacred piece. But you can have your own opinion upon that. On that. And here's the last of these three pieces. Excuse me. So the questions are, is this a secular piece or is this a sacred piece? And um, you might have not believed me that I thought the last two were sacred pieces. I think this is actually a secular piece and I have some evidence to support that. It's kind of a frivolous, fun piece. What's the ethnic origin? Well, it sounds like it could be from Latin America or South America. And what words does this music invoke? Fun? happy-go-lucky, free, that type of thing, to me at least. This was done by Zacchino de Abreu in 1917, an uh, Argentinian, no, Brazilian, Brazilian uh, composer. It's called Tico Tico no Fuba. It's a happy, very fast um, Brazilian choro music. It's a choro form. The choro form has, different, uh, has lots of different key signatures. And in this piece, there are actually three different key signatures. I didn't play the last part. Uh, in preference of time. The, uh, the title means Rufus Colored Sparrow in the cornmeal. And Rufus is a red tan color that they refer to birds a lot. So there's, there's a Rufus colored hummingbird, etc. It's, it's been adapted by Charlie Parker, but my favorite uh, uh, com uh, person who took this on was the alto sax player who was born and raised in Baltimore, Gary Bartz. So if you listen to Tico Tico from Gary Bartz, you will have a blast. So we see different types of music. Sometimes it's very hard to distinguish whether they're secular and whether they're, um, they're sacred tunes. And, and the best I could say is if it feels sacred to you, it's a sacred tune. If it feels secular, it's a secular tune. It doesn't matter. But what it does matter is when we are praying together, and that's why we're doing this, uh, this, this talk on, on the sound of the sacred, to, to see, well, how does this affect me? Do, do I like it? Does it enhance my ability to, um, to feel the emotions of the, of the uh, liturgy that we're dealing with? So I want to go back a few thousand years, like many thousands of years, and talk about a theoretical timeline for ancient music evolution. And the reason for this is, one of my point is going to be is that music is hardwired in the brain, that man and music and speech co-evolved over time, over the last 60,000 years. So here we go. So the human voice is probably the oldest known uh, musical instrument, and the, um, the hyoid bone is essential for, for human speech and for human um, vocation, uh, vocalizations as well. And that was first the oldest known Neanderthal hyoid bones from 60,000 years ago. And this is the hyoid bone, and it sits above the Adam's apple, 
and it helps support the vocal apparatus, larynx, etc. Without that, you don't you don't speak. So we think that that vocalization started back then, and we also many people think that music started back then as well. There are many many uh, antique, ancient flutes that were um, unearthed and dated back to thirty thousand to fifty thousand years ago. This is quite fascinating. These were mainly made out of bone. The one that the ones that survived were made out of bone, and they were carved out. And just imagine, 30 to 50,000 years ago, or 60,000 years ago, uh, someone carved out a bone from a vulture and put holes in it and made sounds out of it. And the thought is that they were trying to imitate the birds, they might have been trying to attract the birds so they can capture them and eat them. Uh, it might have been a way to communicate long distance because it had that high pitch. So that's pretty old. The flutes are really old. Percussion instruments came around the same time, 30,000 to 50,000 years ago. And there's a, a great picture of um, uh, like a xylophone with different uh, sizes of rocks that can make sounds. And that's from about 11,000 years ago, but I don't have it in the slide deck. What I do have is, is actually rather recent, but it's amazing. This is from a tomb, the Zenghui tomb in Hubei, China. And this is from 433 BCE, and these are all these are all uh, drums in the background here. You can see them. There's actually uh, 65 chime bells and covers, so they're chimes. They cover five octaves, and in typical Eastern uh, music fashion, they have semitones between the two notes. So let's see if we can do it. This is an A. So the Zangui bells will have tones like, not the A, in between, they bend the notes and they, they have semitones. Well, I have to bend it to, to get that. The inscriptions of musical events and musical theory were on these bells, so it's really a, an amazing ancient uh, find. It's thought that there were actually five performers that, that, that did this when they had performances. And these were um, ritual performances for funerals as well. So lyres, uh, uh, actually before lyres and um, after percussion instruments were trumpets. In, in King Tut's uh, uh, tomb, they found two trumpets. And that was about um, 4,000 years ago. Lyres were discovered 2,500 BCE. And this is the typical type of lyre that you would have seen at that time. It's from Queen, do you know Queen Puabi? It's from Queen Puabi's cemetery um, in Ur, in Iraq. And Ur is actually the homeland of Abraham and Terah, and our forefather Abraham from, uh, this was 2500 BCE, where this was found, this, this uh, um, lyre. And Abraham was several hundred years later than that. And here's a picture of it. You can see that a picture from the times that it had about 11 strings to it. And we'll hear what a lyre sounds like in a second. So the first known written music was from 1400 BCE. And this is an etching of that. And it's a Hurrian hymn to Nikah from 1400 BCE. And this is a transcription of that based on lots of research that this expert lyre player, lyrist, is what they call him, Michael Le Levy, or Levy, uh, and this is his performance. So it's quite amazing, we're listening to music that was composed before the first temple was built. So I want to move on to some theories of the origin of music, because it'll further cement that notion that, that our human brain is wired to, to take on music and to appreciate music, and, it, and music's evolution was part of our evolution. So Darwin said that uh, music was developed as an elaborate form of sexual selection, and he, he developed that notion based on what lower animals do. There are thousands of animals that sing, and some, like songbirds, can memorize tunes, and 
some of them can even improvise. And Gibbons do that as well, and he was looking at that as a part of sexual selection. These are all theories because obviously no one knows really what, what this is about. But uh, the other theories are that music and language rose from a common precursor called musical language. To me, that's very appealing because as soon as the man, as soon as the Neanderthal could start to grunt and make sounds, he could also start to vocalize and make, um, make pitches as well. So, and there's another theory that music and, uh, and had two different origins. One developing from speech, because as people speak, there are inflections of pitch when you speak, and you can develop music from that. And that's actually one of the reasons why the music of the Orient and the speech of the Orient is so much different than our speech here and our music here, uh, the Western music, Europe and, and in the Americas. Uh, so another possibility is that music just was um, just came into being to to express certain emotions that you couldn't express with speech. And I think that's probably part of what's going on here. But then music was also part of fulfilling a practical need to organize cohesive labor, long distance communications, enhance communication with the divine or supernatural. So in our case, we're trying to enhance communication with the divine, I, I believe. Coordination, cohesion, and cooperation in families and communities, and communities that sing together stay together. Families that sing together generally stay together. And to ward off predators and enemies. So last but not least, I want to just very briefly discuss the neurobiology of music. Because what I'm saying, what I have been saying, is that the brain is probably hardwired to appreciate music. And I want to show you some of the information that, that backs that up. It's fascinating. So the way that, the, the, the new way that people can understand how anything affects the brain is through functional magnetic resonance imaging. So fMRI, fMRI measures brain activity by detecting changes associated with increased blood flow. And I'll give you an example. So if you're in a totally dark room and you shine a light in somebody's eye and you measure the blood flow in the back, in the visual cortex where the eyes are, um, the input to the eyes go, you can see increased blood flow within about less than one to two seconds. So that's about the delay from when the light is shined to where you actually see it back here, the blood flow. So basically, an increased blood flow is coupled on the fMRI with increased brain activity. So you can see the increased blood flow with the fMRI, and then you can um, deduce that there's increased brain activity. The spatial resolution is three to four millimeters, so you can tell exactly in the brain where all of these things are happening within three to four millimeters, and sometimes even the later, later studies, one to two millimeters. The time resolution, temporal resolution, is one to two seconds. So very quickly after you hear music, you can see uh, in the brain what the changes are. So this is an amazing study. And one of the, the interesting things about the study is the studies, uh, uh, here you can see this, the main, the uh, initial uh, writer of the study, uh, Tali Simintov. This is a study from Israel from uh, Tel Aviv mainly, and uh, co-workers in Jerusalem. And they did a meta-analysis, an analysis of hundreds of studies of people listening to different types of music, rhythmic music, music with only a melody, like some of the things I played, or, or, um, or music with, with mainly harmony. They found certain differences in the areas of the brain that change, but these are 36 areas in the brain, all different parts of the brain that change their activity when you passively sit and listen to music, which is incredible to think about. The brain is affected in all different areas, down here, up here, and in the middle here as well, and in both sides of the brain, both sides of the brain. And what this particular um, study demonstrated is that most of these areas in the brain are receptive areas for, for auditory areas, but also they're in some areas that affect emotions, they're in areas that affect cognition, they're in areas that affect speech, they're in areas that affect reception of speech, so they're in all these areas, but what's so incredible about this study is that it determined that um, 
that these patients had a very bright spot right here. It's the bluish spot right there. And that spot is in the frontal cortex right here that determines motion, that determines um, you know, your ability to move your muscles. Even though there was no motion in any of these, any of these uh, subjects for this study, so, so there's a connection to the motor strip and, and motor, and they're, they're very excited about this, and we'll see what that means. But uh, needless to say, what this demonstrates clearly is that the brain is hardwired for, for music, even passive listening to music. And this is a study which, as a musician, I found fascinating. It's from Charles Lim, who was at Hopkins uh, years ago, and then he moved to, to Stanford. He's done TED Talks on this topic. He's really gone big with this. He's a, a semi-pro or amateur tenor saxophone player, jazz. Then he took some of his buddies and he said, let's go and scan your brain and see what happens when you play. And this is an older study, so he used PET scanning, which doesn't have the same resolution. It's not as good as the fMRI. He's done these studies, he's repeated them with fMRI, but I don't have them for this talk. And this is what happens to the brain when those um, musicians were just playing scales but doing simple improvisation, but scales mainly. And you see huge areas of the brain that light up, and some areas of the brain that are, that are suppressed, actually. And here, this is what happens when you do jazz improvisation. You can see a similar finding, but there's more suppression of the frontal lobe. This, these areas aren't enhanced. And what that means is in order to perform and create like this, you have to get yourself out of the way. You have to actually decrease your uh, your frontal lobe uh, input. So it's very interesting stuff. So in conclusion, number one, music appears to have played a very prominent role in human evolution. I believe that, and I think the data supports it. Number two, the brain is highly activated and altered by listening to and performing music. The brain is hardwired to appreciate music. Music can affect humans in profound ways, in profound ways, and that's why we're talking about music and how we can appreciate it and how what the biology of it is as well, because it has to do with how we, how we appreciate our sacred music, the liturgy. And sacred and secular music actually can be very difficult to distinguish. The same musical type, uh, types, the same musical scales, the same musical rhythms are used in both, and sometimes it's very difficult to distinguish one from the other. So, so to complete this talk, what I'm going to do is to play a piece by Mozart that I think is a divine, divinely inspired piece. This was written in 1777, when at a time when Mozart was destitute, he was highly depressed, um, and he was looking for a job. He had just quit his job in Salzburg several months before. He's looking for a job and he can't find it. He's 21 years old at age se uh, in 1777. He was born in 1756 and died in 1791. He did all that he did, the amazing uh, uh, improvements and changes in music that, that Mozart brought upon us. He did that in a short 35 years. But I, I think that this is one of the most sacred pieces of music around. Um, his biographer, also believes that this aria for the flute, the, f the first movement that I'm going to play, the aria for the flute is just one of the most uh, beautiful that you can hear. And the way Mozart actually wrote music was he heard it in his head first, but he didn't write it down. When he wrote down the music, he just wrote out the parts that he heard in his mind. So when I hear that, I think about divine inspiration, but maybe even direct inspiration from a higher power because we don't really know where those creative centers are. We don't know, we, we have an idea where they are, but we don't know how they work. So with this in mind, I want you to listen to Mozart's um, flute quartet in D major. The flute quartet is based on a string quartet, but the first violin is switched to a flute instead. So it's the flute, violin, um, viola, and cello. And I'm going to play two movements. The first movement is the slow movement that is just divine to my, to my opinion. 
opinion, in my opinion. And the second movement is the end movement, which um, is more, it seems a little more secular to me, but still could be divinely inspired. <laughs>
We couldn't do it without him. And please stay tuned for future uh, programs that we put on through the Learning Committee at Beth Israel. Uh, we try very hard to get a lot of different ideas out there, and we've had some great programs, so please join us in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>